Hey guys, today we're going to talk about proteins, right? Proteins. Not like proteins, but like proteins. And Mr. Zane is going to facilitate the lecture today and pause it so you guys can ask questions and have a discussion. And then whatever notes you don't finish in class, you can finish at home. So our essential questions for today, and this is textbook section 3.12 to 3.14 and 5.13 to 5.16. Make sure you're reading those. So why are proteins important to living things and what do they do? How are proteins formed from amino acids? What are the amino group and the carboxyl groups of amino acids? What is the role of enzymes in the body? How can enzymes be denatured? And what do enzyme activity graphs tell us about optimum pH temperatures and denaturation? So let's get started with our notes. Essential question number one, why are proteins important to living organisms and what do they do? So proteins are super important. They're one of those four categories of macromolecules that we talked about, and they're used in all of those, not all of those, they're used in most of the chemical reactions that take place in living things. So remember, if you are a terrestrial being, you live on the surface of the planet, you rely on, and you're an animal, you rely on other things to eat, right? Like producers, they produce all the energy, they harvest that energy from the sun, and they convert it into glucose, right? They store energy in glucose. And plants use different proteins to facilitate that process. So proteins help in the chemical reaction, they support the chemical reaction that results in storing energy in glucose. So super important, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be here. And that's not the only cellular function they're involved in. They're involved in quite a bit. So remember, photosynthesis, right? Carbon dioxide in, water in, sunlight in, and you produce glucose. We're going to spend a unit on that soon, actually. And the result is glucose, or sometimes amylose, and oxygen, right? Proteins are also used in the opposite chemical reaction. That's cellular respiration. And that's the process of taking that energy that's in glucose and breaking that glucose molecule down and storing that energy in ATP. So that's another cellular function that proteins are used in. Glucose goes in, ATP comes out. Proteins are used to replicate DNA. So when your DNA is making a copy of itself before your cells divide, you need proteins to get that process done. Proteins are workers. Their job is to get stuff done in the cell. And they also build a lot of you. A lot of you is built out of protein. Transcription, which is the process of making RNA, and we'll talk more about that in a later unit. For now, you just know that transcription is a cellular process that uses proteins. So that was kind of just like real basic, short, quick. Um, other proteins, there's next rotation, you're going to do a lab that deals with enzymes. And then there are TED Talks that are going to talk about the different types of proteins and some um, cool proteins that spiders make that help make super, super tech. It's pretty cool. Okay, so let's keep going. How are proteins formed from amino acids? Now we're getting to the important stuff. So proteins are built by the ribosome. Ribosome is an organelle in the cell. So the ribosome reads information in mRNA that's carried from DNA in the nucleus. And we'll talk all about that in another unit too. But for now, we're just going to focus on this part. The ribosome itself puts amino acids together to make a long chain, right? So this is still dehydration synthesis, but now we have an organelle that's facilitating that process. So ribosomes are going to put amino acids together in a chain-like fashion to create a protein. And we'll, the actual chemical process of protein synthesis, we'll do in another unit. The monomer of a protein or a polypeptide is an amino acid, right? 
So there's lots of, there's 20 different types of amino acids and we'll talk about that in a minute. But here we have leucine, which is a type of amino acid. It's a monomer. And you're going to put those amino acids together, things like valine and glycine, alanine. There's 20 different, well, there's more than that. We talk about 20 different types of amino acids that are common to the different types of life on Earth. Now, you are not going to have to know all 20 names. That's okay. When you put amino acids together in a chain, that chain is called a polypeptide. Proteins are formed from a collection of polypeptides, right? So you go from amino acid, one amino acid, you put a string of amino acids together to create a polypeptide, and then you put multiple polypeptide chains together to form a protein. So here's another polypeptide chain. And these polypeptides together are going to bend and twist into shapes depending on certain characteristics of these amino acids. And together they form a protein. It's the arrangement or the primary sequence of these amino acids that determines the shape of the protein. And I have a little simulation that you'll see in a few minutes about that. So let's talk about the different types of structures. So when we talk about amino acids, there's different levels of structures. The first level is the primary structure, and primary structure is literally just the order of the amino acids. So here we have amino acid 1, amino acid 2, amino acid 3, amino acid 4. That's the primary structure. It's like when you line up. Now secondary structure is how that line of amino acids bends and twists based on certain characteristics of the amino acids themselves, whether they're polar, whether they're charged, right? They bend, they can form what's called um, a helix or like a fan type structure. And then the tertiary structure is how that entire chain bends based on those same properties. Now this is hemoglobin and you can tell because there's a little heme group right in here. But you can see, so if you look at, here's the amino acid chain, and that chain bent to form this kind of like fan-like structure, like when you fold a fan, this is actually a helix structure. Yeah, it's a helix. And then if you look inside this protein, you can see that helix structure, and you can see the whole thing is bent into this big twisty shape. The big twisty three-dimensional shape is tertiary structure. Another way to think of it is in terms of dimensions, right? So primary structure, right? And then secondary structure, you've got two-dimensional shape. You've got length and width, right? So primary structure is one-dimensional. It's just a line. Secondary structure is two-dimensional. You've got both length and you've got some height. And then tertiary structure is really when you're, you've got three dimensions, right? So you've got up and down, left and right, and now you're bending forward and backward in space as well. It's three dimensions. So one dimensional straight line, two dimensional helix or pleated sheet, and then three dimensional structure for tertiary. So now let's zoom in and talk about the actual arrangement of an amino acid. So we're going to zoom down from the protein level and we're going to look at just one amino acid and look at the structure. So amino acid structure. And that's essential question number three. What are the amino group and the carboxyl group of amino acids? I know we're going kind of quick, but remember you can pause it anytime you need. So amino acid structure. So there are five basic parts of an amino acid. You've got your central carbon, because remember, this is an organic compound. Organic compounds are synthesized by living things, and they're built around a carbon molecule most of the time. This is called the amino group. It's a nitrogen and a hydrogen, a series of hydrogens. So remember 
the first day I had you take notes on macromolecules and I had you create the table and we talked about the CHO, one, two, one, CHO, so this was carbs, right? This is lipids, and this is one, two, few, and then we had CHON, and that was proteins. CHON, C-O-H-N. If you have CHON, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen in an amino or in a macromolecule, you know right away that it's a protein because we have this nitrogen here. And then the other one was CHOMP, and that was the nucleic acids, right? Because they have that phosphorus, they have that phosphate group. So right now we're in CHON for proteins. So we have carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, right? You've got a other hydrogen attached to that carbon to help make it stable. Remember this hydrogen or this carbon wants to bond four times. Here we have our carboxyl group. Sometimes you'll see it written like this. Sometimes you'll see CHO2. You'll see it written a lot of different ways. But what you need to know is that it's got a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen and then a hydroxyl group. This is your hydroxyl group right here hydroxyl hydroxyl okay let me erase all this stuff okay and then you have an r group now something else you can see in amino acids you'll notice there are tricks to identifying different molecules. This guy looks like a butterfly. Right? You got that butterfly structure. That's another giveaway. So giveaways that you have an amino acid, you have an amino group. Sometimes you'll see it written in H3. You've got a carboxyl group over here. And you've got a side group. And you see that butterfly structure. If you see those things, you know it has to be an amino acid. Now, there are 20 different types of amino acids. Each amino acid has a different side group or a different R group. That R is not an element. It's not an atom. It's like a variable in algebra. This R stands for a group of molecules that are attached right here. And there are 20 different groups that can be attached there. So if there are 20 different R groups, that means there are 20 different types of amino acids. Each one has a different R group. So that R group can be very simple, like glycine. It's just a hydrogen. Or if it's alanine, that R group is actually another carbon with three hydrogens. Or if it's the amino acid valine, it's got a very large R group. Now it's the properties of these R groups that determine how that polypeptide chain bends and folds. So amino acid structure, particularly this R group, is the thing that gives the polypeptide its shape. And it's the properties of this R group. Is this charged? Is it not charged? Is it hydrophilic? Does it like water? Is it hydrophobic? Does it not like water? All these things push the amino acid chain around and cause it to bend and fold. So here we have four different amino acids. And just to make sure that we understand the structure, let's see if we can find the different groups and what's different about all these. Well, why don't you take a minute and discuss it with your classmates? What's the different part? Okay. Well, the amino group is the same. Make sure you draw an amino acid and you have the amino group labeled. The amino group's the same. It's the same on all of them, right? This thing, what is this thing called? 
This is the carboxyl group. The carboxyl group is the same. It's the R group that's different. So this is the R group for this one. This is the R group for this one. This is the R group for this one. And this is the R group for this one. So it's the R group that's different. So we said earlier that amino acids um, are linked together by the ribosome. But let's take a look at the molecular place where that actually happens. So here we have an amino acid. And you can tell it's got that butterfly structure. Right Here's the butterfly. And you also have that R group. It's a dead giveaway, right? Butterfly. You've got the amino group, right? Or if you don't want to do the butterfly thing, because sometimes they're drawn differently. Remember, here's your amino group. Here's your carboxyl group. And here's your R group. That's another dead giveaway that this is an amino acid. All right. So when amino acids bond together, and this is facilitated by the ribosome, right? It's still the same process that we talked about before. It's dehydration synthesis. And we're going to form that water molecule. Now, the bond between two amino acids is called a peptide bond. You have to know that name. It's called a peptide bond. And then the polypeptide, that long chain, bends and folds based on properties of this R group. How do we break a protein down? Well, same process that we've been talking about this entire unit, hydrolysis. All we have to do is add that water back in and break it apart, right? And that peptide bond is broken with the help of water and enzymes. Now let's go back for a second and make sure that we understand that amino acids, when they form that chain, it's always between the, I don't think that's right, actually. This is right, yeah. So whenever amino acids bond together, it's from the nitrogen of one amino acid to the carbon in the carboxyl group of the other, right? That's important. You need to know where that peptide bond is. So there's our water molecule. It's going to break that peptide bond. And now you have your two amino acids again. So remember, when amino acids bond together, it's always between the carboxyl group of one and the amino group of the other. And it's this carbon to this nitrogen. And then here's your H that breaks. This H comes off, and it combines with that OH to form H2O. And then if you want to break it, you do the same thing. You add that H2O back in, right? And you break those two molecules apart. This is how we break down proteins when you eat food. So it's important. This is particularly important when you are taking different supplements. So a lot of people take vitamins and minerals like supplements in their diet, and that's fine. But be very cautious about supplements that try and sell you different types of proteins. Like it's good to have a protein shake after a workout, right? Because what happens is your body breaks down the protein in the in the protein shake, and then it uses the amino acids to help rebuild the muscles that you were working out. So there's nothing wrong with that. The stuff you have to be careful about are things that tell you, like, take this particular protein to improve this thing. Because that protein gets broken down in your stomach. And there's no guarantee that your body's going to rebuild it into the protein that it was before you ate it. So just be cognizant of that. Okay. Let's talk about enzymes. So enzymes end in ASE. So if you see something that ends in ASE, you automatically know it's an enzyme. Enzymes are a type of protein. That's why we talk about proteins in general first, and then we talk about enzymes. 
Enzymes are workers. Their job is to do stuff. They either break stuff down or they build stuff up. They are the helpers that help all these chemical processes. Remember when we talked about what proteins do in the body and I said they're the workers, they're the doers, they do stuff, they facilitate all those chemical reactions. Enzymes are a huge portion of that. Enzymes help build things up or break things down in the body. So enzymes are a type of protein and they lower the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. So I know you guys haven't had chemistry yet. So there's a thing called activation energy. And it's kind of like, you can think of it as the amount of energy that's required to start a reaction. So some chemical reactions just happen on their own. Other chemical reactions require energy to get started. So enzymes help reduce that energy to help get started. So think about it like, when you're pushing something really heavy and you have to like put a bunch of energy in to get it moving to overcome that inertia, it's kind of like the same thing. It's the amount of energy that you have to put into a, a reaction to get it going. Or like if you've ever if you've ever had a lawnmower, like an old school lawnmower, you have to like prime the engine and like pull the crank to get it started. Well, that took a lot of energy to like pull that chain, right, to get that lawnmower started. It's the energy you put in to get a chemical reaction started. Enzymes help break down food, right? So amylase is an enzyme. You know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE. And it breaks down this molecule called amylose, which we know is a carbohydrate because it's got that ring structure, right? It's got the ring structure and it ends in OSE. Remember OSE are carbs, right? So enzymes end in ASE. And you can always tell what they break down because they sound like the thing they break down. So amylase is an enzyme that breaks down amylose, which is a carbohydrate because it ends in OSE and it's got a ring. So here's our amylose molecule and it's going to break down amylase. It's going to split it right down the middle, right? So that's a good example of an enzyme that's helping break down food. Now, enzymes speed up specific chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. I just said that a minute ago, right? But let's talk about how they do that. So an enzyme is a protein, and in biology, your form is your function. Your shape dictates your job, right? So the shape of an enzyme, and remember, enzymes are proteins. They're formed from amino acids that bend in certain shapes, that enzyme has a specific job based on its shape. So the shape of an enzyme fits a particular other kind of molecule. So we call that site, that shape, we call it the active site. So you can think of like this particular enzyme, it's like a cookie monster. Its job is to find this molecule and do something to it, either break it down or build it up. But see how they fit exactly? So enzyme shapes are super important. The active site is the portion of the enzyme that fits the molecule it's supposed to work on. And when they come together, we call that the enzyme substrate complex. So activation energy, what is it again? All right, let's talk about it. In chemistry next year, you may have talked about this in middle school, you might not have. Uh, if you took IPS, you probably did talk about this. So activation energy is when you lower the amount, or well, activation energy is the energy that's required to start a chemical reaction so that you get products, right? You start with reactants. Reactants are things that are like ingredients. You put a bunch of reactants together, you get a chemical reaction, and you form products, right? So the activation energy is the amount of energy that's required to get that process started. And here are two different types of reactions, endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions. Endothermic means um, energy is sucked in and exothermic means energy is released. But for now, what you should really know is that the minimum energy required to initiate a chemical reaction is called the activation energy. So when you add an enzyme or a catalyst to this, this graph changes. This hill isn't so big. It's much smaller. And that's a good thing. Because you have reduced the amount of energy it took to get that chemical reaction started. 
All right, so see this activation energy? This is really big compared to just this. So you can think of it as like reducing the bill. So activation energy is like the amount of money that you'd have to pay to get something started. An enzyme is going to help reduce that pay. It's going to reduce the bill. It's going to reduce the amount of energy required to get that chemical reaction started. Enzymes can help build up other proteins, dehydration synthesis, right? So there we have, oh, that is so not right. This line is supposed to be here. Sorry, guys, bad animation. All right, here's our enzyme sim uh, simulation. So let's take a look at what enzymes do, or at least one example. Actually, I think I have it right here. I do. Let's close that. Okay. So, here we have an enzyme. Well, we, here we have a simulation. So we have, we're going to run the model to observe what happens without an enzyme. The catalyst is an enzyme, right? And then we're going to add some enzymes in and see what happens, okay? So this is a chemical equation. We start with A2. These are our green molecules. And we have B2. These are our purple molecules. And what we want to form is 2AB. So we want molecules that have 1A and 1B, right? Now, we need a certain amount of energy to get this reaction going. And that's because, remember, energy is stored in chemical bonds. We're going to have to break these chemical bonds. We're going to have to break apart these A2s and these B2s to reform them into an AB. So when we talk about lowering activation energy, we're going to lower the amount of energy it takes to start breaking these apart by adding a catalyst. Okay, so let's see what's happening. So here we have the chemical reaction that's supposed to be happening, but there's no catalyst. There's no enzyme in there to help. And nothing's happening. And nothing's happening. And I have used a simulation before. I could sit here and wait, and it would take like, it'll take, I think, five or six minutes for like one molecule to break apart. But we're not going to wait. Oh, there's one. But it, oh, see, there's one. But it, it's going to go back together. Watch. It's not going to form. There's no purple ones that are broken apart. So it doesn't have anything to bond with. It, oop. And it's back together. Okay, so let's help this process along by adding an enzyme, by adding a catalyst. So there's an enzyme, and its job is to break up these molecules. So there's one. Let's add a few more. Let's add four. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Now I see some green ones that are split apart. That's good. Nothing yet. Come on, Catalyst, do your job. Do we have a... Oh, we have one! Look! Look, 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 look. There is our, there's another one. We have half green and half purple. That's what we're trying to form. And now, see, the enzymes are bumping into the different products. Oh, look, it's going fast now. There we go. It's going really fast. So you can see how adding a catalyst can speed up the chemical reaction to get the products that we want. Okay. So the function of an enzyme is to increase the rate of a chemical reaction. But their ability to do that can be affected by different things in the environment. So remember, here is our enzyme. 
Our enzyme is our protein. And here is the thing, here's the molecule that it's supposed to be either breaking apart or maybe it's adding it together to something else. Now that substrate, we call that the thing that it's being, that's being worked on is the substrate. It binds to the active site and then the enzyme helps break it apart, right? But different environmental conditions can change how effective this process is. So if the temperature isn't right, the process cannot happen at all because it's too cold or too hot and it's not going to work. And we'll talk about why. pH, if the acidity or the alkalinity of the environment is too high or low, that can change whether this is going to work or not. And then how much stuff there actually is to build up and break down. Well, that makes sense, right? If there's not a lot of stuff to break up, then the reaction is going to happen pretty slowly. So we're going to talk about these things one by one. So enzymes are sensitive to pH and temperature. So this, um, a good example is a fever. So a fever is when your body purposefully changes its temperature, it starts heating itself up as a response to something that's invading. So a pathogen, typically a bacteria or a virus. So what your body is doing is it's adding heat to break the proteins of the invader. Now, that's well and good unless the fever gets too high and you start breaking your own proteins. So here we have a carbohydrate molecule and the average body temperature, right? And here we have an enzyme amylase that's working just fine. It's doing its job. It's breaking up amylose. But here we have somebody that has a fever, right? So they have a fever of 102. That enzyme's not going to work anymore. Its shape has been changed. It's, and we'll talk about that in a second. So if your fever is too high, you're going to denature your own enzymes. You're going to break your own proteins and they're not going to work, which is not so great. Um, but I think that's kind of cool. Like your body is literally like trying to cook the invaders and try and break them using heat. And sometimes if it, your fever gets too high, you end up breaking your own proteins. Oh yeah, we talked about that. So enzymes are very specific, right? They only work on the thing that their active site fits to. So amylase will break down amylose, but it will not break down fructose and amylose. Doesn't work, right? And enzymes are reusable. We can keep using the same enzyme over and over again. I feel like this PowerPoint is out of order. Okay, how can enzymes be denatured? Yeah, this is what, really what we want to talk about. So, enzymes can be denatured or change their shape by conditions that interfere with amino acid interactions. So here we have a protein and it's got its nice three-dimensional shape. It's got this shape for a very specific reason because it's going to do a very specific job. But if the pH is wrong or there's too much heat, you can unbend that protein and then it doesn't do its job anymore. So think of like a slinky. If you ever like get a slinky tangled up and you have to like bend it to untangle it, it never works exactly right. You can never get it back to the way it was, right? It's never perfect again. That's just like a denatured protein. So once it's stretched out, you can't ever get it to go back to the way it was. We call that denatured. So when you change the shape of a protein so that it's broken and it doesn't work anymore, that's denaturing a protein. Okay, here we have a graph that has temperature on the x-axis and we have enzyme activity on the y-axis. So this is cold and this is hot. And this is how well, enzyme activity is how well the enzyme works. So this particular enzyme works best at this temperature. But you'll see that they have a range of efficacy. So that enzyme is still working, right? It's still working all the way up to here. Not so much there. It starts falling, right? So this is the range over which that enzyme works very well, but here is where it works the best. 
that's the optimum efficacy. That's where the enzyme works the best. And you'll notice, once you get past this temperature, what happens? It stops working. Can you guess why? Well, remember that we said if you add too much heat, you can denature the protein and change its shape. And if you change its shape, it's not going to work anymore. So you can see right here, after this point, that enzyme denatures and it's no longer effective, right? So optimum temperature where the enzyme works best, right? Here's the range of efficacy. It does work here but it works best at this temperature. And then after that point, you've got too much heat and that enzyme has denatured and it doesn't work anymore. So high temperatures can cause enzymes to denature and those reaction rates fall. Now, colder temperatures also can be inhibiting, meaning they can decrease the chemical reaction. And that's because enzymes, or well, all molecules, remember, temperature is a measure of heat energy, right? And we, it's related to how fast these molecules vibrate. So if the molecules don't vibrate fast enough, they're not going to bump into each other. They're not going to bump, the enzyme's not going to bump into the substrate. They're not going to meet because they're not running around. It's like playing tag in slow motion, right? Like you're never going to catch another person if you're running too slow. So let's take a look at that and see how that works. Here's our denaturation simulation. So here we have, these are proteins, right? These are, so you can see the individual amino acids and you can see how it's all folded up, right? So here we have proteins that are at very low temperatures and you can see they're shaking just a little bit. They're not moving very much, right? Remember enzymes are proteins. They're not moving pretty much at all. But as you increase the temperature, they start moving around a little bit more, right? That the more they move around, the more chances they're going to bump into, if they're an enzyme, they're going to bump into the things that they need to break down or build up. That's all well and fine. They're still basically maintaining their original shape. They're not changing too much. But notice as I increase the temperature, see how they start spreading out? Those don't look anything like the molecules that we started with. And you can bet that these guys can no longer do their job. They're moving around a lot. Their shapes are changing all the time. They're not going to be able to function and do their job. These proteins have been denatured. What happens if I go all the way up? It's like a bad conga line. All right, so remember we started, oh, here, let's reset it. Here are our proteins, they're nice and folded up, right? They're not moving around very much, which means they're not gonna bump into stuff to be able to do their job. As we increase temperature, that thermal energy, it's gonna cause the molecules to vibrate a little bit more. They're gonna move around a little bit more, which is fine. They're still holding their shape, right? They're not changing too much. But as you increase the amount of energy in the system, they lose their shape, and that's denaturing. Okay. Oops, that's not where we were. Where were we? We were all the way here. Okay, nope, we did that one. Here, 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 right. Okay, let's get rid of that caption thing. So it's not just temperature that can denature an enzyme or it affects its ability to do its job. It's also pH. So here we have acidic, right, on the low end, or we have basic or alkaline on the higher end, right? Enzyme optimal pH. So we can see whatever this enzyme is, this is its rate of um, action or how effective it is. It is most effective around a neutral pH of 7. Now, not all enzymes have the same range. They can be different. So if the environment is too basic, meaning too many hydroxyls, or too acidic, meaning too many hydrogen ions, that can cause the enzyme to denature and change its shape and not work anymore. 
Now, the range of these varies widely among different types of enzymes. Some enzymes are designed to work in very acidic conditions. Other ones are designed to work in basic conditions. And your digestive system is a perfect example of this. Your stomach has very, very acidic conditions and there are specific enzymes that work in your stomach. They are designed to work in very acidic conditions. Now, your intestines, on the other hand, they're very alkaline, they're very basic. There are different types of enzymes that work in your intestines. So if you had stomach enzymes that got into your intestines, they're not gonna work because the conditions aren't right. They're gonna denature. Oh, here we go. So example, the optimum pH of your stomach, right, can be as low as 1.6. And protease, you know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE, and it breaks down proteins, right? So protease breaks down proteins. They function best at acidities of like 1.6, right? But then there's other enzymes in your intestines that are designed to work way up here, right? Okay, here's another graph. This graph is looking at substrate concentration. So this is how much stuff there is to build up or break down. And here's your rate of reaction again. Now, here's our enzyme, little fortune cookie looking things, right? And here we have our substrate, these little dots. These are the little things that are being worked on by the enzyme. Now, if there's not a lot of stuff to work on, the reaction rate is going to stay very low because there's not a bunch of stuff to work on. As you add more stuff, the enzymes can work on more stuff. But there comes a point when there's so much stuff that the enzymes can only work as fast as they can, right? At that point, we call that the point of saturation, meaning all enzymes are busy and they're working as fast as they can. They can't work any faster, right? So every single enzyme is busy doing its job. That reaction can't go any faster unless you add more enzymes, right? So the saturation point is the point at which all the enzymes are busy. So it doesn't matter how much more stuff you add, it doesn't matter how much more substrate you add, the enzymes are busy, they're working as fast as they can. So substrate concentration refers to the amount of substrate that's available. And as the concentration of substrate decreases, the reaction rate decreases. Well, that makes sense because there's not stuff to work on. As that concentration of substrate increases, so does the reaction rate until you hit that saturation point when all the enzymes are busy, right? So when the, all the enzyme active sites are full, we call that reaction saturated, meaning it's full. It can't go any faster. Okay, here are some practice questions that I would like you to discuss with Mr. Zane. You can write the answers in your notes, okay? And then make sure you upload your notes for credits, all right? So also be aware that next rotation, you and Mr. Zane are gonna do an online lab that looks at enzyme activity rates under different conditions. And it's a virtual lab, so you're gonna need a device and he can also do it up on the board. Um, and I'm going to have you answer some questions and make a table and a graph, okay? So, and I think that will really help nail your understanding of how enzymes work, all right? So have fun. As always, if you have any questions, send me a remind or send me an email. You can also get a hold of me on Zoom. Um, I had a couple people get a hold of me this week during office hours because they wanted some help explaining stuff. Remember, I'm always available to Zoom with you and help explain stuff. You just got to let me know when you need me, all right? So I'll talk to you guys soon.